This is a special podcast presentation from 700WLW.com. This is Doc Thompson On Demand. I made it. I battled the white death this morning. And I made it in. Yeah, did you hear Sloney and Tracy yesterday? Sloney was, uh, or, uh, Tracy was wigging out. Oh, I'm never going to make it home. I walked in the studio. It's blowing. There's snow all over out of nowhere. He's flipping out. I'm going to have to call a car service. Walk back in about 45 minutes later. There's no more snow. <laughs> we'll uh, discuss the white death at 11.06 this morning on 700 WLW. Right now, Chris Finney joins me from Coast. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Doc. It's a pleasure being with you. Pleasure to have you on. And uh, you have some some thoughts on Jeannie Smith, Congresswoman Jeannie Smith, and the uh, the ethics questions. Yeah, I think this has been a little undercovered in the news. Uh, we have a congressman who has accepted uh, a half a million dollar illegal gift uh, from the Turkish Coalition of America. She sits on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And... Um, then she lied about it on her House Ethics Committee forms three times. She said she she had no gifts, and she said she had no loan. Uh, she was the subject of an investigation from something called the Office of Congressional Ethics, which essentially found that she had, in fact, violated House rules, had, in fact, committed uh, the offense of lying on her uh, disclosure forms to Congress, and uh, then later the House Ethics Committee whitewashed that and said, well, she did, in fact, accept an illegal gift. She did, in fact, misreport it, but she uh, didn't know who was paying her lawyers, that she was shocked to learn that uh, they were getting paid a half a million dollars from this third-party group that has a fierce interest in foreign affairs uh, when she sits on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And... Um, we have an oral argument on a case. This all derives from her litigation against uh, David Kerkorian. We have an oral argument in... Um, now, Kerkorian uh, was the, uh, one of the people who challenged her, right? In, in 2008. Right, okay. And she alleged he made certain false statements about her relationship with the Turkish lobby in America. And um, she's dragged him through four different legal proceedings, running up his legal bills, trying to destroy this guy, but using special interest money to do so. And then just this week, the development is that she finally, after uh, five months after the House Ethics Committee ordered her to tell the truth, to update her financial disclosure forms, on the 3rd of January, which was just disclosed this week, she finally filed her amendment disclosing she had, in fact, accepted a half a million dollars of illegal money from the Turkish Coalition of America. Okay, so let me get this straight. So you have Kikorian who there, you know, there is a defamation suit there, and she needs legal help. So she gets legal help that's paid for by this Turkish American group. Right. If you or I wanted to sue somebody for defamation, we'd have to pay a lawyer out of our own pocket. But because Jeannie Schmidt is a member of Congress, and people want to curry favor with a member of Congress, the Turkish Coalition of America came into her in December of '08 and said, "Hey, we're going to do this for you, and we're not going to charge you any legal fees." to do that. And since then, they've paid her lawyers in Washington, D.C., a very expensive lawyer named Bruce Fine out of Washington, D.C., and another one out of Columbus, Ohio, by the name of Don Bry with Chester Wilcox and Saxby. they paid him at this point over $450,000 of real cash on behalf of Schmidt because she's the personal plaintiff in these actions and um, uh, paid her legal fees for her. That's bad enough, but then when it came time to report to the U.S. House clerk, which she's required to do every year, who had given her gifts. She lied, and she said she had received no gifts, and she had received no loans from the Turkish Coalition of America. We reported her for that, and like I say, this Office of Congressional Ethics recommended her for uh, investigation and prosecution. And uh, the House Ethics Committee whitewashed it and said, well, yeah, she had accepted a half a million dollar illegal gift, but she had no idea who was paying her legal fees. That, uh, that, that is certainly questionable, Chris. I mean, listen, if I have legal issues, I, I know who's paying my legal fees. I, I, right. It's me, well, or if someone else is paying for it, I know because I don't have to then. Right. Well, let me just say, I'm an attorney, and under the rules of ethics under which attorneys operate, if a third party is paying your legal fees, you have an affirmative duty to disclose that to your client. So we know that she knew because... The lawyer was required to tell her. We also have her lawyer under oath telling us 
that he told her in 2008 that the Turkish Coalition of America was going to be paying these bills. So regardless of, of her being in Congress, she knew anyway. She knew anyways because of the you, you have to disclose it. So she knew, and then you add Congress on top of it where she just had to disclose it. Correct. And, and you know, when they, when they nailed Ted Stevens in Alaska, when they nailed Duke Cunningham in California for uh, accepting bribes, essentially, what they nailed them under was under this issue, not that they showed a quid pro quo that there was money for a vote, but what they showed is just that they lied on their disclosure form about accepting illegal gifts. And in the case of Ted Stevens, it wasn't even in the amount of a half a million dollars. It was less than Gene Schmidt has accepted in the illegal gifts at this point. So uh, the, 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 the felony charges that those two guys face are the exact same offenses that Gene Schmidt has committed uh, three times in this case. Uh, she's currently pending an investigation before the Office of Congressional Ethics. There's a group out of Washington called CREW, the Center for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, they have named our local congressman one of the 14 most corrupt members of Congress, and they have recommended her to the FBI and to the House Ethics Committee for prosecution for lying to the House Ethics Committee when she told them that she did not know, because there's proof that she did know. And uh, that, that complaint is currently pending and being investigated. This is, this is very serious. This is, um, this is, you're right, it probably has been underrepresented in the news. It hasn't been covered a whole lot. Why do you think she was cleared? I mean, this seems pretty questionable. If they looked into it, why do you speculate she was cure, uh, cleared by the, yeah, well, the House, uh, House Ethics Committee? Well, what we've learned as we've gotten into this is that the House Ethics Committee, notwithstanding the Charlie Rangel and Maxine Waters prosecutions, most of the time they see it as their job to... Um, uh, to whitewash uh, what a member of Congress does. Uh, it's very rare that the House Ethics Committee ever disciplined anybody. We were told by crew before we brought the complaint that what they would do is they would that the Office of Congressional Ethics, which is an independent citizens committee, that they would look at it and they would recommend prosecution. And that's exactly what happened in this case. They said then it will go to the House Ethics Committee, which will whitewash it, and they'll blame somebody else for the congressman's bad act. And again, that's what happened. I'm giving a series of speeches over the next month and a half to talk about not just the Gene Schmidt case, but the fact that the, the House Ethics Committee, which we all look at as you know, the per party that's supposed to clean house up there, they really see themselves, they see their job as whitewashing the offenses of members of Congress. Well, right so off, I'm, the flaw is that they are members of Congress themselves. Right. And so the Republicans and Democrats scratch each other's backs. And they basically wink and blink at some of the most serious violations up there. And most of the time, the FBI gets to these guys before the Office of Congressional, or be sorry, before the House Ethics Committee ever does its work, because Duke Cunningham was not uh, in, uh, uncovered by the House Ethics Committee. That was the FBI. Uh, when they got Tom DeLay, when they got um, uh, the guy from Ohio, uh, Bob Ney, mm -hmm. the House Ethics Committee ultimately didn't do anything on those matters. This was all driven by the FBI. The House Ethics Committee is a whitewash committee, and it sees its job to exonerate members of Congress and give them an excuse when they go back to their district. So really, the, yeah. only, the only time that they are stepping up as the, the House Ethics Committee is when it is so obvious there is no way for them to, to overlook it. That's correct. Let me just tell you real quickly, we have a letter that Gene Schmidt wrote to the House Ethics Committee on May the 27th of last year, on May the 27th of 11. And in that letter, she acknowledges in writing for the first time that she knows that the Turks are paying her legal fees, that the Turkish Coalition of America is paying her legal fees. 14, or 21 days later, she had to file her 2010 calendar year disclosure form at the House clerk. Three weeks after she disclosed she knew who was paying her legal bills, she then files another report with the House clerk saying, I have no gifts and I have no loans. And her excuse is that she didn't know. But only three weeks earlier, she had written to the House Ethics Committee telling them she knew exactly who was paying her legal bills. So we really have a question. First of all, why a member of Congress and why our member of Congress would put herself in the compromised position of having accepted a half a million dollar illegal gift anyway, but then committing the multiple offenses of lying about it over and over and over when she files a form that's a felony to tell a falsehood on that form? And she did so. And in the third instance, we can show without a doubt that she knew that she was lying uh, on that form. So 
Uh, we are uh, there are currently uh, uh, complaints pending with the IRS because that's a taxable gift, with the Federal Elections Commission because it's a campaign contribution, and like I say, Crew has a further complaint pending with the House Ethics Committee plus with the FBI to have her investigated for lying uh, to the committee. You know, it's uh, it, this is really frustrating. If you, if you look at it three times, that's the part that, that is really incriminating, that it was three years, three different times that she did not file or provide the proper information. Correct. We filed our complaint in July of 10. So for a whole year, and she knew about it at the time, there were media reports, and we published the complaint online. So she had actual notice of our complaint. And in the complaint, we told the committee that the Turkish Coalition of America was paying her legal bills. A whole year later, she files another form with the House clerk saying, I've received no loans and I've received no gifts, when she fully well knew, and she even acknowledged in writing that she knew, that the Turkish Coalition of America, as of the filing of her ethics form in 2011, she fully well knew that, in fact, they were paying her fees and she had accepted an illegal gift. So I'm looking at it here. She, um, in 2009, received $162,000 in legal fees by the Turkish coalition. Uh, then in 2010, she got another $276,000 in legal fees from the Turkish coalition. What is, what is the Turkish coalition? You, you, I mean, is there speculation that you know, maybe they were doing her a favor for some other reason? They were looking for a vote down the road? Yeah, the Turkish Coalition of America is a fierce advocate for the government of Turkey in the United States, It's uh, which, which, by the way, is a, a fairly radical Muslim government. The Turkish government has been moving further and further into the Muslim sphere. For the, If you've been following the news, there's a lot of upheaval even now in Turkey moving in that direction. But the Turkish Coalition of America is uh, closely tied. It, it's fully funded by a guy, it's kind of a weird name, by the name of Ayali Ayasin, who's a billionaire out of Boston, Massachusetts, and he owns a company called Hittite Microwave. He is, I believe, a Turkish-American, and he founded that group with, I think, like a $50 million gift. And the Turkish Coalition of America, you can go to their website, but they, they fiercely advocate in favor of policies uh, benefiting the government of Turkey. And Gene Schmidt now serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and she actually serves on the subcommittee dealing with Turkish affairs. So she, her vote is directly implicated many times a year on matters that are very deep, near and dear to the heart of both the Turkish government and people who are advocating on their behalf, which would include the Turkish Coalition of America. And um, so, yes, I mean, look, Jean Schmidt used to be an aerobics instructor before she went to Congress. If she was still an aerobics instructor, I highly doubt that the Turkish Coalition of America would have an interest in funding a half a million dollars of her legal fee. The reason that they want to curry favor with her is that she is, in fact, a member of Congress. She's one of 535 very powerful people in this country. And if you can direct money to the benefit of those 535 people, we've seen it over and over, you end up getting favors from the Congress. And... Uh, uh, as I said before, in these other cases, it's very, very difficult to prove a quid pro quo, that she exchanged this half million dollars for any specific vote. Well, yeah, because the argument always is, well, I was going to vote that way. Right. And, and so, unless you have, like, documentation where it says, I'll do this in exchange, you're not going to catch anybody. Right. So even in the most extreme cases of Duke Cunningham and uh, uh, Tom DeLay and, and uh, Bob May, I believe that they don't really prosecute you for the quid pro quo of uh, taking a bribe in exchange for a gift. What they prosecute you for is lying on your ethics form, lying on your financial disclosure form of saying, I didn't receive a gift, when in fact you had received huge remuneration from these uh, lobbying groups. And in, in our case, and I, it's so rare in southwest Ohio that we have a scandal, really. I mean, it, there's a trial going on in Cleveland right now with the chairman of the Democrat Party who was on the take, and they have hundreds of hours of wiretaps of this guy. Uh, but it's so rare in southwest Ohio that we have corruption. And when I ran across this and realized the extent to which our representative had been compromised, uh, I decided I needed to speak out about it. We filed the complaint against her, and we pursued it uh, vigorously through the process. You mentioned that. What is, what is your motivation in this? You just uh, you are somebody that is that offended, bothered by corruption? I mean, we all should be, but is, is that what's driving you here? Well, you know, I've been a watchdog. We did the Lori Quinlivan case recently. Uh, we're doing the mayor's car case. 
Uh, I'm with the coalition opposed to additional spending and taxes, and we've been a watchdog for good government uh, for a decade. And, you know, there's no one politician uh, that will escape our scrutiny, and there's no one pol- – and, and Republican and Democrat. And there's no one politician uh, that would um, – uh, be necessarily the subject of it either. But we've watched Gene Schmidt's career closely and are very concerned about it. I also serve as the uh, attorney for David Kerkorian in these multiple proceedings. Uh, I co-counseled a case, the first one, where she su- she's suing uh, in two different, or really three different cases. And um, I've represented David in all those. The first one I co-counseled with celebrity lawyer Mark Garagos, uh, out of California, mm-hmm. he was Michael Jackson's attorney and Scott Peterson's attorney. We did a two-day trial in Columbus on two of the charges. And um, we were looking over at her table, and she had, all the time, she had two lawyers that flew in from Washington, D.C., two very powerful lawyers. Uh, Bruce Fine is the attorney that drafted some articles of impeachment against Dick Cheney. I believe he drafted the articles of impeachment that went through against Bill Clinton. I mean, this is a very high-powered Washington attorney and another guy by the name of David Saltzman. And then, in addition to that, we had our attorney from Columbus, Ohio. And we're looking over at the defense table saying, how is she paying for all this, and how can this be legal? How can a member of Congress accept? We knew it wasn't tens. We knew it was hundreds of thousands of dollars of free legal fees for this case when it's illegal. And so we looked into it, we asked the questions, and we learned early on that the Turkish Coalition of America was paying her legal fees. And understand what's happening, regardless of how you feel about the case or how you feel about David Krikorian. The question is, do we want powerful sitting members of Congress to harass legally their opponents, who they don't like, using special interest money out of Washington, D.C.? Because what it's really designed to do, and she's admitted this, is to silence Krikorian. She wants him to stop speaking about her relationship with the government of Turkey and with uh, Turkish special interest groups. Well, Chris, I'm, re- I'm really interested in hearing more about uh, about the ethics in, in general. You're, you are going to be speaking, though? You're going to do a whole series of them around town? I have five engagements, and they'll be on my website, and they'll be on the Kikorian website, uh, and they'll be on the Coast website. We have five speaking engagements set up to talk about uh, really the whole problem with the House Ethics Committee process, that they refuse to prosecute even the most obvious violations of the rules by members of Congress. When is the first one? How soon? Uh, I believe Ball I have Park. one coming up on the, uh, it's Monday. It's like the 29th or okay. 30th of January at the Sharonville Tea Party is the next one I've got. All right. I'm going to try to make it out to a couple because I want to, I really want to hear more. I think regardless of uh, party or ideology, we all recognize there's a huge problem when it comes to these people we elect and there certainly is a lack of ethics. But Chris Finney, I appreciate the information. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Chris Finney from Coast laying out uh, some of the questions in the uh, Gene Schmidt ethics case as well as ethics in general. I'm going to get some of your calls coming up. 513-749-7800, the big one. Pound 700 on AT&T. Doc Thompson, 700 WLW. Doc Thompson on 700 WLW. On the blog right now is a video that a girl made who is a Girl Scout. She's from Ventura County, California. She posted it on YouTube. She's been a Girl Scout for years, and she's urging you to boycott them. Boycott the cookies, she says. It's really odd for a Girl Scout who's been involved with them for a long time to say boycott, really? Well, she wants you to boycott because of the inclusion of transgenders, people who are not fully female, biologically fully female, being included in Girl Scouts. She has a little bit of a problem with this. Check out the video at 700WLW.com right on my blog there. And we're going to talk about it about 10.06 on the big one, 700WLW. Lance's deal of the day is at 700WLW.com. Lake Nina Restaurant and Tavern. It's a family restaurant. It's been in business over 40 years. You can get $20 for only 10. Lance's deal of the day, 700WLW.com. California Assemblywoman, speaking of uh, questionable ethics and legal troubles politicians doing the wrong thing this is a california assembly woman a member of their state legislature she was arrested last fall when surveillance cameras spotted her at a neiman marcus store in san francisco walking out the doors with unpaid merchandise she didn't pay for him her name is mary hayashi she got arrested 
Right after her arrest, one of her spokesmen came out and said uh, she was distracted by a ringing cell phone, and that's why she didn't pay for the item. She got distracted. She uh, was confused. She had the stuff. Cell phone rang. She got in the conversation and walked out. This included leather pants, a white blouse, a black skirt, and others. She was uh, sentenced to three years probation for the shoplifting problem. Now, though, he said it, it wasn't the, the cell phone. That wasn't the problem. No, nope. she was diagnosed with a benign brain tumor. That's why she did it. The benign brain tumor defense. <laughs> her spokesman said her medical condition resulting in her arrest has been taken care of. It's been taken care of now. She's decided that uh, she will uh, press forward. Being treated, it's been taken care of, and it's no longer affecting her concentration or judgment. Boy, that's pretty convenient. Yeah, that it was a problem when she got into trouble, but now it's not a problem. It's not affecting her judgment. Now she's good to go. She got some treatment. She pressed ahead, and now she's doing great. Now you can trust her. You can reelect her. It went from cell phone to benign tumor. This is this, the Twinkie defense is the only thing worse than this. Remember the Twinkie defense? I've talked about it with Mark Crumbine, the guy who said he was so hopped up on sugar and fat from the Twinkies and other snack items that maybe aren't the best for you. It impaired his judgment. Hers was the benign brain tumor, not the cell phone after all. Well, if you want to hear a politician doing something right, if you're tired of the bad news, here's some good news. Rand Paul, senator from Kentucky. He has just returned $500,000 to the U.S. Treasury of unspent money from his office. You know how much senators get to run their office a year? What do you think they get? They get $3 million for their office budgets. $3 million. I have no idea why you would need $3 million. You're talking 100 senators. Then you've got 500 and, or excuse me, 435 congressmen and women who get these budgets as well. He didn't spend $500,000 of it. That represents about 15% of his annual cost. So he is writing a big check, passing it back on to the Treasury Department. That's what they should be doing. And 15%, although that's wonderful because none of the others are doing it, that should be the norm. That should be the standard, not some exception. Rand Rand Paul should be one of many that are doing this. And they really want to get get ahead of the game here. you got to cut it by about 50%. They have people that just run around that even though they are not officially working on their re-election campaign, that's really what they're doing. There's a huge part of their staff that goes around and, you know, meets with the people and whatever to to get re-elected. They're not really interested in the issues. It's putting a good face on stuff. That's what it's about. $3 million for their office budget. He said, um, we looked at all of our office expenses. We looked coffee pot, computers, tried to buy things that where our uh, money was uh, going to be spent the most efficiently. He said, our money that we're spending, our goal is not to spend all of it. Our goal is to save some of it. Well, good. Why, why are you buying that many new things? Computers? Yeah, you may need some, but what happened to the guy that had the office before you? Yeah, you need upgrades on you know, a semi-regular basis. But do you need $3 million worth of coffee and new computers and stuff? I wouldn't think so. Well, and he proved they didn't need $3 million. They only need 2.5 even, and everything was fine. He said if Congress offered incentives for lawmakers and staffs to cut their budget, he said we could save $130 million annually. That's great, but the incentives, what, what does he mean by incentives? The incentives should be you're elected to Congress to go in and do the right thing for your constituents, and that would be spending our money efficiently and effectively So when you and I have to go to work every day, when you and I are saying, wow, how much are you taking in taxes and I can't afford to feed my kid? I can't afford to to save for some college or have medical care or anything like that? And and you're needing incentives? That that should be your incentives. Your, Your constituents that are saying, don't spend our money because we can't afford to live. There's a lot of people that are are barely surviving now and they are paying taxes even though they may have a job paying taxes on gasoline and all kinds of stuff. Well, if you senators and congressmen weren't spending this amount of money, 
we would have more money in our pocket, period. So, Rand Paul, good job. Now what are you going to do? And what about the rest of you? Stock tops at 700 WLW. At 1133 this morning, you're getting an update on the Caitlin Markham disappearance. Has there been any new evidence, any new information? We're going to talk with some uh, some people close with her and her family at about 1133. They're also having a vigil, a candlelight vigil. All the details, 1133 this morning. 700 WLW. Randy in Jackson, Ohio, how are you? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, sir. I got a couple questions to run by. Uh, who makes up the ethics committee for our Congress, anyhow? Congress. Okay, so... <laughs> Let me. Uh, why do those people continue to stay in office when they're in there and not doing their job? I mean, it, either fire them or do away with them. Uh, it, wouldn't, doesn't that seem right? It's ridiculous, Randy, that we would have an ethics committee in the House of Representatives made up of members of the House of Representatives. They're, they're going to police themselves? I mean, that makes no sense. Randy, that would be like... Uh, the ethics committee of 700 WLW being made up of me and Sloney and Tracy and Willie. I mean, if you're, if you're saying we want to make sure Doc and Willie and Sloney and Tracy are, Tracy are ethical, but they're going to be the committee to decide if they're being ethical and if they violated anything and could get in trouble. That makes no sense. Yeah, yeah for sure. And, you know, I, I, I've said for years and years, there's a reason why people go out and spend millions of dollars to get an $80,000 a year job like Jeannie Smith. Well, it's a $175,000 a year job oh. right now, plus perks, but you're right. It's still not worth spending the millions and millions and all the time and effort, unless you consider, Randy, that a lot of members of Congress, they will go into Congress making average salaries or having an average middle-class life, and they leave Congress after a few terms, quite often, having millions and millions of dollars. Absolutely. Well, and, and, and you may recall the, uh, the 60 Minutes investigation, and we had the guy on who had the, uh, the book about the same thing, about the insider trading. That's what we're calling it, insider trading, where members of Congress, because of their position in Congress, have information that you and I will not have. Government contracts, investigations against certain uh, industries. They, they are privy to a lot of information, much like members of Wall Street would be privy to information. Wall Street... You're forbidden from using that information to profit. You cannot say, listen, I know this company is going to release earnings reports that will likely tank the stock, so I'm going to run out and sell mine today before they do it. Yet members of Congress can do virtually the same thing, and they exempted themselves, they exempted their staff, and their families. Why why would you exempt yourself? Do you realize how outrageous that is? Why would you exempt yourself from something you don't think, as members of Congress, that's a problem? You don't think that's, that's questionable? That's a conflict of interest? There's only one reason they would exempt themselves. Because they want the money. Period. And when a couple, a handful of decent people in Congress have tried to change things like this, right after this came out a few months back and we talked about it, we talked about the 60 Minutes report, we talked about the guy who had the book out on it, There was a couple of members of Congress who introduced legislation that would turn that around and say they no longer can do it. That legislation was never passed. Why? Because they want to make the money. It simply comes down to they want the money. Exempting themselves over the years for all kinds of things. So that's the reason they would spend millions and millions of dollars to get a job that pays them $175,000 a year. Now, certainly that's far more money than you and I make. It uh, you know, comes with a whole lot of perks as well. You can be vested and, uh, and get some sort of retirement from serving just one term in Congress. And the longer you stay, the more you get. They have a congressional dining room. They have a workout facility. They have a congressional workout facility that uh, is under the Capitol. It's uh, supposedly beautiful. They have all of these things. Yeah, it's a good job there, but that's not the real motivation. The real motivation is get into Congress, stay a couple of years, and walk away with millions of dollars because you are privy to information that the average person isn't, and you will use that information to buy and trade stocks. Some of the most supposedly ethical members of Congress that serve on the ethics committee or investigate other people are people who are guilty of this very thing. Some of the members of Congress who pretend that they are morally superior 
or believe in smaller government, more freedom for the people, platitudes like that are people that are the most responsible. It's both Democrat and Republican. Their motivation is make a whole lot of money, and I can't fault them for that, except when it is doing the wrong thing and telling us the whole time that they're doing something different or believe in something different. I got uh, some job information. I try to update you on any uh, job information, any new jobs that are coming, some positive news or a place you may be able to get a job or make a little side money. I'm going to share some with you coming up next. 700 WLW. Doc Thompson on 700 WLW. All right, some information for you. If you're looking for a job or if you are on unemployment and you know that it is due to run out in the state of Ohio, January 28th. Yeah, January 28th. A lot of people were scheduled to lose their unemployment benefits. So, Ohio Senate passed a bill this week that would try to keep those people from falling off unemployment. 22,000 Ohioans would lose their benefits January 28th. Now, this means that workers will qualify for an additional 20 weeks of unemployment checks. The bill has moved to the House so they can vote on it and do their you know, changes and whatever. But it is moving forward. If you're somebody that knows your unemployment benefits are going to run out in a couple of weeks, January 28th, They are doing some stuff. You may be somebody that's frustrated by the amount of unemployment that some people get. I understand that. But uh, for those people, this is probably a welcome report. January 28th, they're uh, they're going to lose it. This would extend benefits 13 to 20 weeks, an additional 13 to 20 weeks. So if you are ready to lose yours, steps are being taken. Hopefully the house will get it done for you very soon. Got some more information on a company that's hiring. Now, this is a company that normally hires seasonally for the spring. But about half of the people they they hired last year became permanent. We're talking about Home Depot. They're going to hire nationally 70,000 seasonal workers for the spring. This is their biggest season, the spring. People go and buy tractors and grass seed and everything else. They normally hire a lot of people. But as I said last year, about half of them ended up permanent cashiers, salespeople, lot and garden staffers. They have right now about 300,000 workers overall nationally. They'll add the 70,000 seasonal. So if you're looking for a job, maybe that's a possibility for you. If you're looking for some part-time stuff or maybe you have that, uh, that hope that you will be picked up full-time, there's an opportunity. There's also some good news from Home Depot that uh, should make you feel pretty good. Maybe some slight signs that the economy doing a little bit better. Their net income for third quarter last year, that would be uh, ending October 30th, it went up 12%. That's pretty good. Revenue up 4% from the year before. Listen, there's a lot of businesses out there right now that say 4%. Yeah, I'll take that because some of them are losing. So being up 4%, that's pretty solid. And the reason that's important is Home Depot is that housing sector. Yeah, it's, it's people working on their houses, either to stay in them, to rent them, or to sell them, doing that work. So People are putting the effort into their homes, one small part of the housing industry. There's also still on my blog at 700wlw.com a link to Jungle Gyms, because I got the new one open in Union Township, which is 275 and 32. That'll be opening soon. So if you're interested in that one or even working at the other one in uh, Fairfield, you can get the, uh, the application. You can download it right off of my site at uh, 700wlw.com, and it gives you all the information. What do you think about the transgenders being accepted in society? Sure, of course. You're transgender. It doesn't bother me. Go and live your life. Enjoy it. But what about transgenders in organizations businesses, capacities, where that is based on a certain gender. You know, you belong to a a woman's club. There's a gathering of men. And yet, you're not really that gender. Maybe you're working towards that gender. You identify with that gender, but you're not that gender. Well, that's a whole issue right there. But what about when it's kids? What about when a kid says, I'm not really a boy, even though I have boy parts, I'm a girl, or vice versa? Should they be allowed to to go to school that way? Involve in in the sports activities from the other gender? And we segregate sporting events, right? Some schools will allow, some you don't. What about Girl Scouts? A couple of months back, a little boy 
who identifies as a girl, identifies himself as a girl, and his mother identifies him as a girl, wanted to join the Girl Scouts. And this particular group in in Colorado said, sorry, it's for girls and you have boy parts. He got upset. The mom got upset. They called the local TV station. And what happened? The pressure was on the Girl Scouts, and they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. That local branch there, they are not, uh, not following our policy, our national policy. The national policy is to basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, accept anyone into the group who identifies as a girl. If you identify as a girl, you're welcome to join the Girl Scouts. Now, because of that, there is a girl in California who's been in the Girl Scouts seven, eight years, who is now asking you to boycott boycott cookie sales. She said Girl Scouts supposed to be for girls. Do you agree with that? Well, that's a tough one. Listen, I feel bad for you if you're a kid and you feel like you're trapped in the wrong body, whether you are or not, and you feel that way, it's got to be horrible. I'm sure you just want to be accepted. But what about the people who say, listen, I as a girl or I as a boy or I as the parent of a girl or a boy who want to be involved in an organization that is segregated by gender for a positive experience, you're not really doing that. I'm going to share some of uh, both of their stories, and I'll get some of your calls. Coming up next after the news at 10.06 on 700 WLW, home of the Reds.